Today is Saturday, November 24th, 2018, and we are at the home of Mr. Larry Rubin in Bethesda, Maryland to conduct an interview for the Julian Bond Oral History Project, sponsored in part by the School of Public Affairs at American University. My name is Greg Ivers. I am a professor of government at American University and director of the Julian Bond Oral History Project. A copy of this transcript, along with a video interview, will be available through the Special Collections Division of the Bender Library at American University. Larry Rubin was a student at Antioch College in Yellow Springs, Ohio, when, in 1961, he decided to go south to join the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. Mr. Rubin served as a field secretary and organizer for SNCC on and off until 1965, working in Albany, Georgia, and later in Holly Springs, Mississippi, where he helped organize a local labor union at a brick-making plant, one that included black and white members. Mr. Rubin will talk about his time in the Southern Freedom Movement, including Freedom Summer in 1964, and offer his memories and observations of Julian Bond, who he knew as a friend and colleague for 50 years. Larry, thank you so much for taking time this afternoon to speak with us. We appreciate it. Well, first of all, since it's Saturday, um, I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom, y'all. In the South, uh, they, they say um, Shalom, y'all. Uh, they do. So, um, there's actually two ways t to answer that question. Um, what what happened? was I was sitting in the cafeteria having lunch um, at Antioch College when I looked up and I saw Chuck McDew, who was chair of SNCC at that time. And he had been there to visit his girlfriend, Marjorie House. And I joined them for, um, for lunch. And the next thing I knew, I was in southwest Georgia getting arrested. I was in... Terrell County, Georgia, and Dawson in jail. No, I mean, um, it wasn't quite like that. Uh, I had driven uh, south to be at some SNCC meetings when SNCC was getting itself together, being organized. And I can't remember the exact um, locations. I never said anything, but I went down with a few other people. Uh, so I knew Chuck. Uh, I knew to go over to sit at his table. But the other way, and I think the more profound way to answer your question is, I went south because I had no choice. This is what people like me do. I was brought up... Um, to believe that to be a, a full human being, that one of the marks of a full human being, a mensch, is to fight for justice, to fight for freedom. And it was just natural for me to go south. Um, it was also uh, based upon a political analysis, which was very common at the time. Uh, a few years later, if you were to ask most white uh, SNCC volunteers, and I was not a volunteer, I was, uh, I went, I, another answer is I went down there for the money. It was $9.65 a week. You know, it was, that's $10 after taxes. Um, but if you were to ask most white volunteers, why they went south. They would say something like, uh, you know, we were taught in, uh, in school that America, in America, everybody was equal. This is a land of freedom. And then I was shocked to see on television Bull Connor turning the fire hoses on people in, uh, in Montgomery, just trying to register to vote and trying to, I mean, in Birmingham, uh, just trying to register to vote. and, and trying to uh, use public accommodations in Birmingham. 
and I was so shocked. Um, I went south because I wanted to make America the way it is supposed to be. In my case, I was not shocked. I was brought up to believe that capitalism sucks and that um, what was happening in the South was just part of the way America was. I wasn't shocked, but I was also brought up, as I said, to believe that as a mensch you fight to make things better. So it wasn't that I was shocked that America the way, was the way it was, but I was, it was part of my DNA to make it better. Um, another part of that was a political analysis. This was in the early 60s. And at that time, uh, the American government, the federal government, was being run by racist white Southerners. They were the chairs of most of the committees in the House and Senate. And the reason they were the chairs uh, was because of seniority, because they were elected again and again and again. And as chairs of these various committees, they were taking apart the New Deal that our parents fought for. And they were... Um, taking away rights and, and uh, benefits that our parents had fought for. And the reason they were able to do this and to be elected again and again was because many of their constituents, in some cases the majority of their constituents, couldn't vote because they were black. So we felt, and when I say we, I mean people like me, and also, um, what SNCC was saying to the rest of the country to encourage people to come south, if we, uh, if blacks were able to exercise their right to vote, they would vote out of office these white racists. And uh, that would be good for everybody, for the whole country. So I went south not to help black people. Black people were doing very well without me. I went south to support as best as I could uh, and to do what, as little I could to help people who were risking their lives uh, for the right to vote. But I did it to help myself and to help the whole country. Well, now we get back to that lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was late 61. Uh, and I actually didn't go south until early 62, I think, you know. I'm getting on and <laughs> mix up some, some dates, but I believe it was early 62. Um, and as I said, it was just natural to do this. Also, um, I, a lot of people wanted me to run for community manager at Antioch College, which is like student government president. But to do that, I had to write a paper. And I was having an awful lot of trouble writing that paper. So I got out of that by going south. I figured, you know, if I go south, I didn't have to finish that, that paper. And that was a fact. Um, so I flew to Atlanta. Uh, most people coming from the north that work for SNCC went to Atlanta first, where the headquarters were. And we stayed there in Atlanta just long enough to meet the requirement to get a Georgia license, driver's license, and license plates figuring that when we went south, if we had Ohio plates or Pennsylvania plates or New York plates, um, it would be more dangerous than if we had Georgia plates. That was true, but it was not true that anybody mistook me for a Georgian. 
no matter what I did, people knew some kind of way I was from the North. Uh, were you among a few, a lot? How many, how many people from Antioch went south, uh, got involved in the movement? Well, Antioch was a very small college. Um, there was a total uh, of 2,000 people. Uh, only 1,000 were on campus at any one time. So I am proud to say that I will betcha, uh, percentage-wise, Little Antioch had more people there than any other uh, place. We had Joni Rabinowitz went, um, Terry Shaw, uh, Stanley Boyd, uh, several others went for uh, various periods of time. Joni, like myself, uh, went uh, and she dropped out of Antioch uh, and was in southwest Georgia. Um, I was, uh, we were all lucky in that, in, in a sense, in that Antioch was a work-study school. We spent six months on campus and six months off. That's why I said before, there's only 1,000 students on campus at any one time, although the student body was 2,000. Um, so when I went south, part of the time I was actually on a co-op job. And part of the time I had dropped out just to, to do this. But Antioch was very sympathetic and very supportive. Matter of fact, when I went back to Antioch, um, well, I'm jumping ahead a little bit, but um, my lung collapsed after, oh, I was going to say six, seven months in southwest Georgia. Uh, I had a sp spontaneous pneumothorax. My lung collapsed. And I found out later it was just from the nervous tension and the fear. I mean, I, stay afraid. I stayed afraid for five years. It was this tight feeling in your stomach. Just from, you learned to live with it, but I was never not afraid. One of the results was my lung collapsed. So I went back to Antioch um, to see doctors rather than to go home to Philadelphia because I, I felt more comfortable. And, uh, and plus which medical care was free since I was somehow connected with Antioch. Uh, and I was, I was at Antioch for, for about three m months, I believe. Um, no, a little bit longer. Um, it was, yes, uh, uh, having my lung reinflate itself. Found out later I could have had an operation, but the doctors there were homeopathic doctors. So they just said, lie on your side and the lung will reinflate itself. While I was back at Antioch, um, my lung healed. And I first I went to Washington as a community organizer uh, at Barry Farms uh, uh, housing development, public housing development, where I met Charlene Krantz, who at that time was a, um, a, a high school student. And she had organized her high school. Uh, Students Against Discrimination was her organization. I was a community organizer there. And uh, then I guess I went back to Antioch because I went from Antioch in August of 63 to the Marshall Washington. It must have been right after that I went back south to Mississippi. But to go back to when I first came, I flew to Atlanta. This was now I'm jumping back several years. Hung out there for as long as it took to um, get my license. And I hung out with SNCC and with a guy named Jake Rosen. I don't know if you have ever run into him. He was with the Progressive Labor Party. And he was, I guess, their southern organizer. And he was close to SNCC. I might have even stayed at his house for as long as it took, took me to get the driver's license. Um, and that's where I first met Julian. As a matter of fact, 
I met Julian the first day. I get I get off the plane in Atlanta. Somebody drove me to the office. I think that was Auburn Avenue. I think Ray, uh, Raymond Avenue was later. Or I might have that mixed up. Maybe it was the other way around. But I believe it was Auburn was first. Snick's first offices were on Auburn Avenue. Yes, that's where it was. And then they moved over to Raymond Street. Raymond. Which was right off Hunter Street, which was literally around the corner from Pascal's and Frazier's. And that was yes. the hub of uh, student life for because all the black colleges were around the corner. Yes. Uh, Morehouse and Spelman, Clark, all the from from where many activists had come for the Atlanta student movement. And Snick settled in there around 1963. Yes, it was, it was before that. Yeah. So this was the Auburn office. And if I remember correctly, you had to walk upstairs to get to the office. And uh, the office was like a shotgun house, you know, a bunch of rooms all connected. Uh, and it was very crowded. This was everybody was there, but at the end of the, at the end of the uh, uh, hall, you know, which was running through offices, there was Julian Bond, at a mimeograph machine. That's my, was my first image of him, cranking stuff out on a mimeograph. So this is the first time you meet Julian. Yes, my first day working for SNCC. Uh, here's the difference. I met Bob Zellner the, that day too. And he shook my hand, and there was a buzzer in his palm, you know, uh, one of those uh, trick things. That was Bob, you know, who was big and uh, all over the place and very ebullient, and, yeah. you know, bzzz. Yeah, the, the buzzer was a sixth grade phenomenon when, I, when we used it. Yes, exactly. You just put your finger on something, too. <laughs> Julian was cranking something out and I went up, you know, introduced myself and uh, he was introduced himself. Uh, you know, welcome to SNCC. He, he said the exact right things. Uh, and I felt accepted somehow automatically. I think it was because and this was this was my lasting impression of Julian. Julian accepted himself so much, so well. He was so self-possessed that when he was with you, you knew it was him, him saying hello to you. It wasn't that he was, um, what's the word, effusive. Well, you know, he wasn't. Um, Oh, hi, uh, hi, you know, but just just the way he said, hi, welcome to SNCC, uh, you felt absolutely accepted because he was, ex he was this real person, quiet, but real. And that was always my impression of him. And that was always my feeling with him when he became head of the NAACP after he was a host of Saturday Night Live. I mean, he was, became a big shot. But whenever he would see you, you would just feel totally comfortable uh, because he was comfortable with himself. So when you are, are back in Atlanta and you, you meet Julian for the first time, you, you then go down to southwest Georgia for a second round, or is this your first round? This is my first uh, I forget exactly how long I stayed, but you can look it up. However, whatever the law was about getting a, a Georgia license, that's how long I was in Atlanta. Okay, and then from Atlanta you go down to Southwest Georgia. Yes, I was assigned to Southwest Georgia by Jim Foreman. I had no idea where I was going to go when I first went to Atlanta. So it's almost like being inducted. You, yes. You show up and they give you your orders. Exactly. Okay, so once you're down in Southwest Georgia and you need to work with people up in Atlanta, what kind of relationship did you have or the people down in Southwest Georgia have with the communications office in, New York, in, in Atlanta and your relationship with Julian and the other members of the communications team? Well, at that time, we saw the Atlanta office mostly as a safety thing uh, because 
we had to uh, uh, contact them every day, and we knew if uh, they didn't hear from us, they would, you know, send help. And that was protocol? Yes. Can you describe how that worked? Like when you say you had to contact them every day um, at a certain time? Um, I don't... A certain number of times? Later on in Mississippi, I definitely remember, yes. It was twice a day. Somebody had a call at a certain time. And they had the Watts line, the wide area telephone service. I don't know whether they had that in Atlanta at that early time or not. But um, it wasn't... We, in, in Southwest, they, they, they must have had the watch line. It was just a cheap, cheaper way because uh, of using the telephone uh, instead of paying for all these calls. It wasn't that I called in every day, but somebody from the project had a call in every day. Um, and also, they were our communications with the outside world. Uh, for example, uh, the first time I was arrested was in Terrell County, Georgia. Terrible Terrell. There was, there was terrible Terrell. There was Dirty Darty, where Albany was. There was Bad Baker, which is where I was assigned. But um, when I was assigned to Baker County, uh, first, well, first we were in Albany, which is the big city. Then uh, this was the beginning of what we call the Southwest Georgia Project. So uh, myself, Jack Chatfield, and John O'Neill, who later founded the Southern Free Theater, or the Free Southern Theater, uh, were all assigned to live with Mama Dolly in Baker County. And um, so one day we were uh, canvassing in Dawson, in nearby Terrell County. Canvassing meant walking from um, tumble down shack to tumble down shack and really talking to folks about anything, really. You didn't pop up and say, we want you to register to vote. Mostly what I did was stand there because my main job in Southwest Georgia and in Mississippi basically was to be white and not be in charge and to show both the black and white community that blacks and whites could work together and whites not be in charge. So we were um, walking down, the, first we were driving down this red clay road in Terrell. And we pulled in at a, um, uh, a general store, which we thought was owned by a, uh, a black guy. We pulled our car in, and we went into the general store. And ironically, uh, on the wall of this little general store was a picture of Julian Bond uh, advertising, what was it, RC Cola or Pepsi or something, holding a bottle. Uh, they had a campaign of all the good-looking kids in uh, Atlanta. Uh, I had several friends who were good-looking that we were in this ad campaign. Here he was, Julian Bond on a wall, drink, I, I think it was RC or whatever it was. Maybe it was Pepsi. Uh, well, that was a Southern Delight, an RC Cola and a Moon Pie. Moon Pie and RC Cola, that's right. Uh, the owner told us to get the hell out. He was scared of us being there. So we did, but we left our car in his parking lot. We go canvassing, deputy sheriff drives up, arrests us for trespassing uh, because our car was on the property of what turned out to be a general store owned by a leading white racist in the community. There was a little article uh, in the paper about us being arrested, and it said that the uh, the the Negro and they, they gave his name called the police to have us arrested, and the 
burden of the article was, you know, the black community didn't want us there. Uh, so I was in jail in uh, Dawson, Georgia. Zeke Matthews was the sheriff. First time I was arrested, handcuffed in the back, scared out of my mind, thrown in jail. No, we knew the scariest part of being in jail is that you uh, are at the arbitrary control of the jailer. You had no say about anything. That's what's scary about jail. But we had a phone call, and one of us called Atlanta. That was our safety line. And once that phone call was made, and we knew that Julian in particular, because that's who we spoke to. I didn't speak to him, but uh, one of the other the two guys spoke. We knew that somebody knew where we were. And that took the edge off of being afraid of being under the arbitrary control of somebody who would kill you as well as look at you. So someone in the so someone talks to Julian Bond in Atlanta. Yes. What was Julian's next step? Um, what would he do to kind of help move things to a place where you felt a little bit less scared, a little bit less uncertain of what the next day would bring? Well, to us, it was just that we knew he was doing something. He and other folks. Um, what he was doing, uh, come to find out was calling old Zeke Matthews and saying, listen, you know, you got our people there, what's, what's the deal? And uh, find out that we were arrested for trespassing uh, and there was a certain uh, bail set or fine or bond, depending upon the situation. And I forget exactly what it was in Southwest Georgia, um, in, uh, in Dawson. Um, and then the, mostly they would arrange for, to pay it just to get us out of jail. We were not there as a witness. Some people, uh, you know, uh, went from the north to the south to bear witness. So being in jail was their witness to blacks being persecuted. We were there to organize. We were there to be out in, on the roads. So being in jail was a hindrance to our work. Um, so we knew some kind of way, we didn't know the details, we knew some kind of way Atlanta was trying to get us out of there. Uh, and depending on the situation, uh, uh, Julian would call the press. Uh, I believe he called uh, my home paper in Philadelphia. He knew, he knew uh, where I was from. He called the Philadelphia Inquirer. Hey, one of your homeboys is in jail in Dawson, Georgia. And then someone from the Philadelphia Inquirer would we'll call Zeke Matthews. Say, What's the deal? Larry Rubin, who's a Philadelphian, is sitting in your jail. Yeah, exactly. They'll call Zeke Matthews. So public pressure would sometimes well, result in, well, well yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't say that public pressure had much to do with the thinking of Zeke Matthews. But... Um, what did, and I'll tell you the story. Uh, as I said, we had one phone call each. The phone call to the Atlanta office was made, which was the main call. Uh, I had a phone call to make. I definitely didn't want my parents to know that I was in jail because I knew that they would freak out. So, um, When was the first time your parents found out you were in jail? I'm about to tell you the story. All right. So... I called my girlfriend in Chicago, a fellow Antiochian who must have been on her co-op job because she was home in Chicago. Uh, and uh, Vicki Levine, hey Vicki, I'm in jail, you know. Uh, and uh, that was it. Well, Vicki, just by coincidence, spoke to another friend of ours, Lois Rivich, who was also from Antioch and also went south herself. Lois was in Philadelphia. Vicki calls Lois. 
talks about whatever they were talked about, plus Larry's in jail. Lois's parents were playing bridge with my parents that night. And they were playing bridge. And the Riviches tell the Rubens, hey, isn't this terrible what happened to Larry? And my parents said, what? What happened to Larry? Oh, he's in jail, you know. Well, old Zeke didn't know what it was like to deal with a Jewish mother. Because my mother started, my mother called him and gave him holy hell. Plus which she called our congressman, who was Robert N.C. Nix. She called our senator, who was Senator Schwaker at the time, Republican. And they all called Zeke Matthews. Uh, and that, I think, had an effect. Here's old Zeke, and he's getting calls from Congress and from the Senate. Um, and from this lady, that barely he could understand what she was saying. My mother definitely couldn't understand what he was saying. Um, in fact, it was kind of embarrassing because there we were in jail, and you know, I was just trying to stay alive with the other... <laughs> with the other prisoners and um, try and act a little tough, you know, to fit in there in, in the cell. We were in jail for three or four days. But one of these days, Zeke yells down the hall, hey, Larry, hey, Reuben, your mommy's on the phone. That did not help me very much. Well, first, there was long discussions within SNCC about whether whites should work in Mississippi. In Southwest Georgia, the project was run by Reverend Charles Sherrod, and uh, he was very, very dedicated to the idea of the beloved community. And he insisted that the staff always be integrated, uh, as I said, to show both white and black communities that whites could work with blacks and not be in charge. In Mississippi, uh, the feeling was different. The feeling there, uh, and in fact, throughout the South, except for Southwest Georgia, that whites and blacks working together were too dangerous, uh, that there was uh, safety in uh, African-American staff members being able to ride in and out of towns, um, and uh, particularly at night, and not be noticed. But if you had a white and black person in a car riding into town, particularly at night, they could be killed. So there was a, a, a policy change, and uh, the decision was made that whites could uh, work, at least a few could work in Mississippi. This became a big issue a little bit later, about Freedom Summer, this, that issue was discussed on steroids. But um, I was uh, in Ohio, and um, uh, I forget exactly, but I, I must have spoke to Foreman on the phone, uh, saying, you know, I wanted to go back to work. My lung had by then healed. It was right after the March on Washington. and. Uh, the March on Washington had an effect on me. It was the first time that I saw so many white people in such big a crowd and they weren't going to shoot at me. And I felt that this was really America. Remember I said before, you know, I thought America sucked. Yeah. Well, the March on Washington showed me that there were many, many people that uh, wanted to build a better country. And I was inspired. And I called Foreman and said, I want to go back to work. So uh, I was assigned to uh, Marshall County, which is in the northern part of Mississippi. And my job was to prepare for what became called Freedom Summer. I don't think we were 100% positive at that time that there was going to be uh, a lot of uh, white volunteers coming down. I think they were still discussing it, I believe. 
or maybe the decision had been made, I forget. But in any case, my job was to prepare, uh, to try to rent a house, to um, get to know who the leaders in the community were. Uh, and I was taking the place of Frank Smith, who actually I had met in Southwest Georgia, and who is now the director of the African American Civil War Museum here, and who incidentally I worked for when he uh, was a member of the DC City Council. But now that I'm talking 10 years or so before that, uh, he had been in um, Marshall County in Holly Springs by himself and uh, getting to know the, uh, the, the natural leaders, the, the, the folks that uh, were already working on voter registration and other things. Uh, and th th this was true in most communities that mostly they were World War II vets. They came back from the war and they weren't going to put up with the shit that they had put up with before they left. They became the natural leaders. So I tried to take over from where Frank left off. Frank had been there for a long time and um, I stayed at Rust College. Now that in itself uh, showed how courageous the president of Russ College was just to let me stay there. Frank was black. And this was an all-black college. So the president of, of Rust, uh, his name was Eddie Smith, uh, could say that... Um, you know, he was a student there. And, but with me, it was very difficult to say I was a student there, being white. It would have been illegal, against the law for me to be there. But they let me stay. So from living at Rust, I was preparing the area as best I could for Freedom Summer. I'm not saying I did a good job at that, but that was my assignment. I fell down a lot. And my other assignment there was to uh, work to set up freedom libraries, which were uh, going to be with freedom schools. Uh, these were the, the libraries. Uh, like I said, I'm not sure that they had decided even to have them, or maybe they did, uh, the freedom schools, but they did decide to have uh, Freedom Libraries, and, and that job consisted mostly of uh, uh, g getting books from the north or driving up there to get books, bringing them to Rust, putting them in a huge pile in the basement of one of the Rust buildings, and sorting th through them and preparing them to um, go to various places for Freedom Libraries. At Rust College today, uh, they still have some of those books that are marked Freedom Libraries. They're on display. And the, the person, the other person that was really in charge of it was Staunton Lynn, the Freedom Libraries. He's a very well-known, very courageous professor and writer. Well, first of all, I, uh, at this point, we didn't call it Freedom Summer. It was this, the, the SNCC Summer Project. Actually, it's the COFO Summer Project. In Mississippi, uh, all the various civil rights organizations, SNCC, CORE, NAACP, probably others, uh, formed the Council of Federated Organizations. And technically, that's who we were working for. And their office was in uh, Jackson. Um, there was tremendous debate within SNCC in particular, because SNCC really led COFO and was the most active part of it. Uh, in fact, CORE didn't want any part of it, except Dave Dennis, who was the organizer for CORE, dragged CORE uh, kicking and screaming into the project. So preparing for the summer project involved two categories of things. One, physical things, like I say, renting a house uh, for us to use when people came down. 
um, the Freedom Library, in my, in my case. The second category, though, was preparing um, leaders for a bunch of white kids coming to so-called help. And that was the hardest part. Um, there was tremendous controversy as to whether to have such a thing. Uh, and Sam Block, Hollis Watkins, as a matter of fact, most of the um, Mississippi organizers were against it because uh, they felt two things. Number one, that it would, it would be very dangerous to have whites and blacks work together. And number two, and probably more profound, was that um, they were just getting some local organizations off the ground in various places. Remember, it took tremendous courage to fight for uh, the right to exercise your right to vote. And they were just making some breakthroughs. And they were worried that uh, all these white kids coming down uh, would take resources away from the organizing uh, and that the white kids would substitute themselves for the local people. That The way Hollis said it is, you know, we finally got communities up out of their chairs to, you know, to work. And now all these white kids would come and they would just sit, the, the, the black kids would just sit back down again and look at the whites. Uh, the argument that won the day, though, was that far from being more dangerous, having whites there would be a safety factor, the, that it, particularly if you had upper class whites, that um, upper middle class whites, uh, that people in the North, particularly decision makers, there was a, a congressman's son was there and other, uh, you know, leading folks, kids were there. If they knew that their own kids were in danger, that uh, they would do something to help stop the danger. Um, you know, remember, eight, eight people were killed, uh, six at the time that we're talking about, um, for just for doing voter registration work. And hardly anybody knew about it um, because, you know, there was just black people getting killed. And the big push was to try to get the federal government to send protection to voter rights workers, which they should because we were uh, protecting people exercising their federal right to vote. And the Kennedy, Kennedy administration should have sent down people as protection, and they were not. So the feeling was if white kids were in danger, that number one, they would get publicity, and number two, that the administration would send down protection. So that argument won. In the meantime, though, uh, preparing the local leaders, explaining that a bunch of white people were coming down, and somehow uh, to reinforce the fact that they were still the leaders of the, of the project, and that even though we were asking them, uh, one of the things we try to do is to get places for these white kids to live. Although in Marshall County, most of them, uh, we didn't live with, with folks. It wasn't like Southwest Georgia where, where I live with Mama Dolly. In uh, Marshall County, project uh, led by Ivan O'Donelson, uh, most of the people lived um, in the office at the Freedom House, one for women and one for men. Uh, but the idea was to prepare uh, local people you know, you are still in charge, and these people are just there to help you, not to take over from you. And you need to understand that. That was preparing. Well, um, there were 
who, who the answer to was who who was mapping out the strategies? It was Bob Moses, Dave Dennis, uh, Aaron Henry, uh, uh, who was a pharmacist, uh, and I think he was with the NAACP. In Clarksdale. In Clarksdale. Uh, a few others. They were mapping out the strategies. Once the decision was made to have the summer project to try to enlist um, lots of white kids, like I said, and particularly upper middle class white kids to come Mississippi, uh, then uh, there were uh, a lot of questions raised. Uh, pre now, preceding this decision was the precision in decision in Mississippi to have all the organizations come together under COFO uh, and then to have Freedom Summer. Uh, in a way it was part of the same decision in a way not. Uh, I don't know the details uh, you know, of exactly who made what decision and where but um, and as a matter of fact just as a general statement I was a foot soldier you know, I wasn't involved in the decision making. I just went where Jim Foreman told me to go and basically did what I was told to do. Uh, and I, I didn't really uh, bother myself too much about the, old, you know, the big picture. Uh, as a matter of fact, this is part of uh, I, I, why I didn't bother myself. Uh, when I first came south, as I said earlier, um, I came for this political reason that we were going to uh, help black people uh, to exercise their right to vote just by giving them a little support and that would make the whole country greater. And the just a general idea that it was my role to make the country greater is from birth. Come to find out, though, that might have been the goal, but the job was making sure Mrs. Jones had a way to get from her farm to the mass meeting. It was just very nitty-gritty, uh, boring stuff and walking from uh, walking from shack to shack and just being white letting the the black organizers do all the talking so that the uh, people we were speaking to could get that this was a black run organization because this was such a traumatic um, uh, epiphany for me to, to understand that my job was just little things, and that, that was the freedom movement, a series of little things. Um, in a way, I went in the opposite direction, and I didn't ask too much about the big picture. Uh, I, all I could do to just keep myself together, um, not throw up every day out of fear, and just do the little things. So when I went to Mississippi, it was the same thing. Uh, I concentrated on trying to get a place for the Freedom School to be, trying to get the books at Russ College, trying to um, just live at Russ College. I was the only white person uh, within miles. That's not quite true. There were some white professors at Rust. Uh, but in my, you know, as a kid, I was now, I thought I was 18, so what was I, 21, 22? Uh, just, keep myself together day to day. I didn't really bother myself too much with what was happening in Atlanta or, um, or Jackson. But to answer your question about the communications department, uh, I did know that uh, now there were two Watts lines and that there was COFO in Jackson and SNCC in Atlanta. And remember, there was more going on for SNCC than Freedom Summer in Mississippi. There was still the Southwest Georgia project, and we had some projects in Arkansas and Texas uh, and elsewhere in the South, uh, Alabama. They were starting even then to create the Lowndes County uh, 
freedom movement. So the SNCC office in Atlanta was doing a much broader job than the COFO office in uh, Jackson. But we were officially part of COFO, but we dealt with both, and we felt good now there were two places that knew where we were. This is also how we knew right away that the three civil rights workers were killed, because they didn't call in. Talk a little bit about the protocol in Mississippi, uh, about calling in, and how did everybody know where everybody was, and then how did you know that maybe something wasn't quite right? Well, um, we wouldn't know that something wasn't quite right in Marshall County, but the COFO office would. And we had to call in, I believe it was twice a day, at certain times. And if we didn't, uh, then the assumption was we were either in jail or dead. Uh, and then um, the uh, Jackson and Atlanta office would, uh, you know, put into effect uh, everything we had. And, and by now, we had uh, lawyers for human rights were there. We had the Medical Committee for Human Rights, um, the Delta Ministry. There was a lot of networks that existed at the time that I'm talking about now that did not exist when I was in Southwest Georgia. So if somebody didn't call in, uh, uh, Jackson and Atlanta knew to call this group of lawyers to make phone calls to the, the authorities. Uh, and and most important, most important, uh, although uh, the Kennedy administration still was not sending protection, there was John Doerr, who was the head of the Civil Rights Division at the Justice Department. Uh, was that true? Was it the Civil Rights Division? It was, it was um, Burke Marshall. I remember, John worked under him. John worked John under. John Moore was the person. He was in Mississippi. He was. That's right. He, yes, he was an assi assistant yeah. to Burke Marshall. He was, in fact, the only person from Washington to really help us and do anything whatsoever. And but, that was true even after uh, the Kennedy assassination. Yes. And so even when the Kennedy administration becomes the Johnson administration for the last year, it was, was still the person that you felt you could count on. We knew we could count on. They, we used to say um, there's a department in Washington called Justice, and there's a town in Mississippi called Liberty. And that's what we, how we felt about the Justice Department. But it was John Doerr. Uh, and so these officers knew to call him if uh, anybody had disappeared. Uh, and uh, they just, as a matter of routine, called Burke Marshall and, and, the, and the, the Kennedy administration, the, the Civil Rights Department, uh, uh, the Justice Department, I should say Bobby Kennedy was uh, Attorney General, uh, just, you know, to get the record. So. That made us feel good, and, and more importantly, um, it helped build the morale of uh, African Americans who were trying to get registered to vote. We really could not offer them too much. When, when we were canvassing and trying to convince people to register, or try to register to vote, uh, they knew that they would get beat up, or they were the danger of getting beat up, I should say. they danger of having their house burnt down, having their mortgage called, any loans they had called, if they were uh, sharecroppers being put off the land. Um, they knew there was a danger of being killed. And, you know, what could we offer them? Well, if you're harassed, we'll tell Washington. That was about it. all the time. Um, I was, from almost the minute I got there, uh, I kept getting arrested on suspicion of this and suspicion of that. Uh, 
stealing the shirt that I was wearing because it looked like something that was stole from a, a clothing store. Where was my uh, bill of sale? Uh, suspicion of stealing my car. The owner's permit wasn't enough. It was the bill of sale. Uh, and that was just local. The sheriff uh, named John Ash, I called him Flick Ash, kept arresting me when I was, especially when I was there by myself. But then something happened to uh, accelerate all of this. Um, I was delivering uh, a load of books. This was in April, in April, I believe. Um, bef well before Freedom Summer was happening. And I was driving a load of books from Greenville, Mississippi um, to, uh, to Rust. I had done this several times. And we were arrested in um, Oxford. And I was arrested this group of us were arrested on um, suspicion of carrying literature advocating the overthrow of the government of the state of Mississippi. That's literally the charge. And um, in order to uh, uh, go into our U-Haul we insisted on, and the sheriff got a search warrant, and that's what the search warrant says. And I have the search warrant. You are sitting next to where my files, where the search warrant is, <laughs> with those words. Uh, so we were arrested on suspicion of uh, carrying literature, advocating the overthrow of the government of the state of Mississippi, which I explained to the sheriff if I was going to overthrow something, I wasn't going to start with no government of the state of Mississippi. It didn't work. Uh, when we were arrested, uh, they let us go after a while. Then we went north to Holly Springs, arrested again in Holly Springs on something to do with not having proper license to drive a truck, except we were, weren't driving a truck. I was stupidly driving a Studebaker Lark, which was a teeny little tin car hauling a U-Haul, which was dumb in itself, but it was not a truck. I noticed that somewhere between the two places, um, I had a uh, address book stolen. But I let it go at the time, because we were just lucky to to be alive, and there was five of us arrested each time. Um, now fast forward to July, and um, Mickey uh, Schwerner and uh, Andy Goodman and JC, Jim Cheney, had been killed. We knew they had been killed because they didn't call in uh, to, to Jackson. Dave Dennis knew that they were killed because um, they were working for CORE. They weren't working for SNCC. Uh, Andy Goodman, as a matter of fact, he had just arrived. There, what was happening was that there was the um, training session for the white volunteers in Oxford, Ohio. Uh, was going on, and uh, Mickey Schwerner got a call that, a, that a, uh, a church had been burnt down in the Shoba County. So he left the training and he brought with him uh, Andy Goodman, who he knew, and uh, I think Cheney, I forgot whether he was at the training or met them, met them down there, he was from the Shoba. Uh, We knew that they had been killed because um, they didn't call in. Uh, Senator Eastland 
James O. Eastland and the entire power structure of the state of Mississippi put out that they hadn't been killed, probably. Now, the bodies weren't discovered yet. Uh, Eastland ran around saying um, they were voluntarily disappeared and were probably laughing it up on Moscow gold in a New York hotel room. So this was saying uh, to any white Mississippian, they're a bunch of Jewish communists. New York meant Jewish and Moscow gold spoke for itself. In order to prove his point that the three volunteers, uh, that this was a hoax, that they weren't killed, this, you had to be there for this to make logical sense. In order to help prove that it was a hoax, Senator Eason gave a speech on the floor of the Senate naming uh, myself and Joni Rabinowitz, who I mentioned before, and a few others, mostly Jewish, uh, as being communists, and we were running um, the civil rights movement in the state of Mississippi. And part of his evidence was he said that uh, they had discovered an address book with the names of a bunch of communists in it. And he was talking about my address book that had been stolen when I was arrested, you know, in these places. And when that speech was made, and it was July 29th, uh, and this paper came out. This is the local Marshall County paper. July 30th, 1964. I don't know if you can see this. It says local civil rights worker has communist background. That's me. And there's there's my picture, and there's a caption that re that reads that I uh, I'm 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 leading a a a, um, a demonstration uh, at at the courthouse, and I'm looking angry about something. Uh, well, there's two things wrong with that. Number one, I wasn't leading a demonstration; I was there. And number two, I was angry because they were taking my picture. Uh, and then there's another article on. In the front page, no room here for communists. And, uh, here it is. Reckless driving arrest by sheriff led to discovery of little black book and communist exposure. That was the arrest in uh, Holly Springs. I was saying something about didn't have the proper license for driving a truck. Now, the reason that little black book is in quotes was that in fact my address they were lying my address book was not a little black book it was a little reddish brown book but they called it the little brown the little uh, black book it led to communist exposure and there's a picture of me this this was taken in oxford when we were arrested several months earlier and the fellow in the picture with me is named John Papsworth. He was from England. And he was um, a nonviolent activist in England who later became actually a leading uh, uh, Episcopal vicar in, and still is a leading Episcopal vicar in England. So um, when that happened, Two things happened. Number one, I was, as I said, never so scared in my life. Because before, at least I could go from town to town and people didn't know who I was. But here my picture was in the paper. And the same articles, similar articles, were throughout the South. In the Jackson Clarion Ledger, in the Memphis Daily Disappointment, whatever it was called. Um, so I was really scared. And number two, I was worried that the black community uh, wouldn't have anything to do with me. And that was one of the reasons that Eastland made the speech. 
he, he made the speech in order to say that it was a hoax. He made the speech in order to tell the white community that, uh, you know, white organizers like myself are fair game. We weren't there for no equal rights. We were a bunch of communists. We were there to overthrow the country, to change the American way of life. And number three, it was a signal to the black community to ignore us. And I was so afraid. I, I stayed in the uh, uh, Freedom House. I was afraid to go out, uh, go outside. I didn't know what to do uh, until a preacher, a black preacher, came to the Freedom House. And he, he asked me, he says, are you a communist? Well, I wasn't. But I didn't want to say no, because I didn't want to feed into red baiting, you know, to the idea that everybody helping equal rights was a bunch of communists out to overthrow the government. Uh, I didn't want to say yes, because I wasn't. So I, I don't know, I mumbled something. Yeah, or, you know, it depends what you mean by communist or something like that. So he said, he said, well, that's too bad. He said, I was hoping you were a communist, because I, I had some questions I wanted to ask you. And then he said, you know, if it get me my freedom, I would paint my ass red. This is from a preacher. So then I knew I was okay with the black community. Uh, and I wasn't, I was still afraid of getting killed by whites, but I knew the black community wouldn't marginalize me. But what happened after that was these arrests that I was mentioning, you know, the, on little things, they stepped up the pace of these arrests. I was arrested for, I forget what, bumping into another car. Uh, I was arrested for this and that. I was arrested for not having the proper button on the uh, floor of the car to have my brights go on. Uh, according to Flick Ash, the sheriff who arrested me, when you mashed that button, your brights were supposed to go on, I'm making this up because I can't remember exactly, in five seconds. And it took me 30 seconds. Except I was arrested in the middle of the afternoon and I didn't need my brights on. But I was arrested during the day of the vote for the Agricultural Stabilization Committees. These were committees uh, where every farmer was allowed to vote. Everybody that worked the land didn't even have to register to vote. Sharecropper, anybody could vote. And they were very important because they decided who would get what for planting or not planting crops. Cotton allotments. Uh, plus the main crop was cotton. Uh, up until that year, 64, not a single black person was allowed to uh, vote. They were just chased away. When I say allowed, I mean they were shooed away by gunpoint. They were scared to vote. One of the main things we did was uh, that year and the next year, some 70 people, 70 African Americans, were elected to these committees. So I was arrested making the rounds of the voting places of these agricultural stabilization committee votes. And that's why old Flick wanted me off the off the land, off the road, and he uh, arrested me on this um, charge of not having the proper thing with my rights. So I was arrested for not having the proper button to have my rights on, and the fine was $200. There I was in jail, and it occurred to me, looking back at all these arrests, that they knew the fine right away for uh, suspicion of stealing my shirt and things with the car and all. It occurred to me, and I, and, and I had always given the fine to get out of jail. As I said earlier, we didn't want to be in jail, myself or SNCC. 
we were given all these fines to flick ash. It occurred to me I had become a cottage industry in the city of Holly Springs. There was more than civil rights working here. They were making money off of me. I will just pay the fine and get out. And that thought made me mad. <laughs> I mean, it wasn't just that they, that they stopped the work uh, with the Agricultural Stabilization Committee elections, but I was giving money to the police department in Holly Springs. So I refused to pay the fine. I said, Flick, you know, you got, you got to come up with something better than the mashing the button for the brights. Uh, so uh, he says, well, how about $150? He started negotiating with me. And I said, Flick, I have given you X amount of money. I remembered it at the time. In the past two months, past three months, and that's it. Not a penny more. I will not pay this fine. Uh, it's ridiculous. And he started to negotiate with him. I have a fifty dollars. No. So, uh, and I, meantime, we're sitting in jail. I don't know, two, three days. I forget exactly. He brought in uh, the um, county prosecutor. I think this is who it was from Tupelo to reason with me. I think Flick figured this guy was from the north and maybe he could talk sense into me. And the guy said, how about five dollars? Just pay five dollars and get out of here. I said, no. And I told him the story. And I think I convinced him that it was ridiculous that I was paying all this money to Flick. But in any case, they, they let me go. That was the last time I got arrested uh, on these stupid charges and paying all this money. Now, and listening to this, like, what, what kind of leverage did you have? Why, why would he negotiate with you? You're under arrest. What kind of, uh, is this just like a game to him? It almost sounds like, I mean, was the hostility gone by this point? I mean, I'm really fascinated by this, where it's almost like you two have developed a relationship, and now he's negotiating with you to pay a fine that you're not required to negotiate. It's like negotiating with the power company. Do you want your power on or off? Well, that's and actually, it's a very good point, and I had not, I've never thought of that. Um, uh, later, though, I learned that uh, Flick Ash there was more to him than met the eye. Uh, right then, at that period of time, he was just a white Southern sheriff like any other. Smack you with a uh, uh, you know billy club upside the head for no reason. He, he arrested me and Ivanhoe Donaldson. He threatened to hit Ivanhoe Donaldson, and you don't threaten to hit Ivanhoe Donaldson because uh, you got hit back. He was not at all that you know. Uh, it was just another you know ordinary cracker. Later on, I found out that he had real political ambitions. Um, and he saw which way the, uh, the wind was blowing as far as this voter uh, registration stuff was. And his political ambition was he wanted to run for state legislature, uh, which he did, and he wanted to run for uh, the clerk of this court. And Mississippi has 15 different kind of courts, and he wanted to run for them. And he also wanted to um, make some money in Marshall County. And he ended up, uh, it was Flick's Lumberyard and Flick's Restaurant. At that time, though, he knew which way the wind was blowing. And I suspect he was trying to build a record of uh, not being so hard on civil rights workers. And later on, you know, 15 years later, he told me, well, you say, you know, I just arrested you all to, to keep you safe from the Klan. The Klan was going to come down and kill you. And that's why I arrested you all, all the time. Did you believe him? No, because he also beat us up. Uh, he had at that time in his, this is 15 years later, in his, uh, in his office a picture of, um, of Eastland and Aaron Henry. 
And he said, I brought these two people together. We seem to have brought them together, he said. Uh, come to find out, actually, he did. Later on. So, I think part of the answer to your question is he had his eye on the future. And by the way, as a white person, he never became a Republican. He always stayed a Democrat. Even after the Democratic Party of Mississippi, you know, was and is majority black. And all whites are members of the Republican Party. He never did that. Well, you know, 15, 20 years later, and I went back to Holly Springs pretty often. Flick just died two years ago. Uh, you know, all Flick would say things like, Trump says today, you know, there, I am the most unprejudiced person in the world, you know, um, which is a bunch of crap. But uh, I, he once told me, he said that he was different from most Southern shirts. He said, of course, they were not educated. He was educated. He had been in the Army. He had fought in Korea. And he said, because he was in the Army, he learned certain disciplined way of doing things. And most Southern shirts were not. And he always claimed that he kept a clan out of uh, Marshall County. I don't know if that's true or not. Yeah, I was going to ask you, did he? <laughs> I have no idea. Well, I'll, I'll tell you how I experienced him. Okay. Uh, when I went through this stuff of um, being red-baited, you know, communists running the civil rights movement in Marshall County or Mississippi, um, most of the people in SNCC didn't quite get what that was about. Now, SNCC had been red-baited from the minute it, it got organized in 1960. And as a matter of fact, there's a famous story, uh, 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 Marion Barry, who was the, the first chair, actually of the Temporary Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, went to um, speak at the Democratic Convention in 1960 and was asked about, are the communists in your organization? And he said what Snick always said, we don't care who they are, what they're doing, if they're willing to put their body on the line, you know, we don't ask what their political beliefs are. Having said that, um, there was a period within um, SNCC, and it was building up, uh, and it was there in Freedom Summer. And frankly, a lot of it came from Al Lowenstein, which was red baiting. Uh, there was, for a while there, Ann Braden, who was a left wing leader, white leader was not allowed in stick projects. So here I am, red-baited. Uh, and there's confusion, basically, among a lot of people. Not among my boss, I'll call him my boss, Ivan O'Donnell, because he was, you know, much more savvy than I was about politics. Um, but Julian Bond, was the major um, exception to what I'm saying within SNCC workers. Now, I, uh, Jim Foreman was too, but um, I, I, at this time, was not relating to Jim Foreman. He was, uh, in, uh, you know, working in Mississippi. But I, I did run into Julian a lot, and Julian understood what this red baiting was all about. You know, the things that I, I said earlier, putting a target on our back, um, alienating, alienating us from the black community. And I could talk to him about my feelings. Now, I didn't know this at the time, but later on I, I learned that um, his father, Horace uh, Pond, the president of uh, Lincoln University, um, they were friends with Paul Robeson and W.E.B. Du Bois that uh, Julian grew up in a very progressive, very sophisticated household. And um, 
So being called a communist was not new to him. Uh, so that's how I was. Uh, oh, oh yes, yes. I I, I wrote this uh, obituary for Julian, and here's Julian Bond, cute little kid who grew up to be a very handsome young man, with uh, Paul Robeson at his house. And the full picture, you can't see it here. This is just a, a cut. But the full picture is Paul Robeson is kneeling in order to uh, get at the same height as Julian. Uh, so that's one thing. Um, and the other, talking about this period, um, SNCC was falling apart. Uh, there was growing tension between white and, and black workers, which, by the way, in 1962, I wrote about and, in fact, had a radio show. And I mentioned that the future of SNCC is going to be, I forget the term I used, but uh, black power. I might have said Negro chauvinism. But what I meant by that was that, I meant this, and Julian fits into this picture in that he understood what I'm saying. And he made it clear to me that he understood it very early on. Um, when SNCC first started, it was a civil rights organization. Uh, and was talking about the right to have a hamburger, but shortly after that, the right to vote. As, Amer as an American, blacks had right to vote because they were American. Uh, and it was part of the, um, the rubric at the time of being a melting pot. America was a melting pot. And so African Americans had the right to vote because they were American. Well, that was true, but that's not the way African Americans really experienced um, segregation and Jim Crow. They did not experience it as deprived Americans. They experienced it as black people. And they didn't want to become part of the melting pot. They want to melt. They wanted to be black. And, uh, you know, have the rights. And part of this, uh, at the time, uh, was a nascent period of growing, uh, you know, the black cultural movement, of black identity. Uh, this was not new. There, were, there, there was the Marcus Garvey movement. Forever there were these movements. But I saw this growing in, um, in the South. And also, the idea of having whites organize blacks just didn't work. I mean, because of Jim Crow, it, it wasn't enough that I was standing there being silent and letting the black organizers do the talking. The people that we were speaking to looked at me anyway as the white guy. Julian understood this dynamic. And um, he understood what was happening, but he did not understand it in the sense of being an angry white, uh, being an angry black person. He understood it at a higher level. He understood it in, in terms of the big picture. And frankly, that's the way I understood it. Um, a lot of whites said that they felt insulted and felt horrible about getting, quote, kicked out of SNCC. But whites weren't exactly kicked out of SNCC. Um, at uh, 64, 65, uh, the people in, who were leading SNCC, it was Stokely Carmichael at the time and others, uh, came to the conclusion that blacks should organize blacks 
and whites should organize whites. And that, in fact, the problem was in the white community. That's where racism came from. And whites should go to the white community to organize. Julian understood this. And part of his legacy in the South, and I want to talk more about his legacy as a national figure later, but I'm talking right now about his legacy as part of SNCC, was he acted as a, um, a moderating force when all this was going on. Um, there's a story, uh, and I was not at the Waveland conference where they made these decisions, you know, that, you know, that, to separate. But I knew a lot of people there. Uh, <laughs> in fact, my attitude by that time was, I mean, I can leave the cell, you know, I'm dismissed. I don't have to get shot at anymore. You know, I'm, I'm relieved. Thank you. But most whites, and, and by the way, I went to work for Ann Braden. Because I, I took literally whites to organize whites. But a lot, of the, a lot of whites were going through horribly traumatic emotional period at this time. Julian took a bunch of white people out to dinner during the Waveland Conference. When, 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 what year would this be? 65. Okay. Um, and explain to them what I'm saying, because he understood it, and basically basically said, don't take this personal. And if you want to stick with the progressive movement, the movement for change in this country, this is where it's at. Black people are, and always really, always have been, the major force for progressive change in America. They brought America from the rubric of the melting pot to the rubric of diversity. Because of black power, you know, they're saying we want our rights not as deprived Americans because, I mean, that was not a, a bad, that was not a wrong statement. But they were not experienced deprivation as Americans, as you know, sort of people that people that had the right to be white, and most people that use the term melting pot, that's what they meant by it. Everybody has the right to be white. Black people didn't want a part of that. They wanted their rights as black people in America. We're not just Americans; we're black people. And Julian understood that. And Julian understood that that had been true from the beginning. And that the reason black people had always been in the forefront of every fight for, um, to advance America uh, was because it was to the self-interest of the black community to advance America. Uh, and even, more, even in a way, more so even than the labor movement. Uh, he understood that. And he understood that not through reading, but through living it, being the son of the people that he was the son of. Um, later, when he uh, became a, a, a national figure, uh, probably mostly because of his good looks and great voice, and he was also an actor, you know, he did, he did some uh, acting in this area. He invited us all to some theater groups that he was uh, acting in. Um, but he knew that he was taking advantage of that about his person. He was using it politically for a good purpose uh, to advance really the progressive movement. And, you know, he helped start the Southern Poverty, uh, the, the, the Southern Poverty Law. Uh, uh, Southern Poverty Law Center. Law Center. Southern Poverty Law Center. 
He was also on the board of directors of every progressive organization you can think of. Um, and much broader than just black rights. Um, he was on, on the board of directors of everything, and, every, and he would do a, a, everything that people ask him to do. Um, I had asked him, to, would he be the moderator for a, uh, uh, a folk song concert that I was putting on of labor and civil rights songs in Lake Worth, Florida? Uh, and he said yes, because he understood the role of the labor movement as well. Um, I think his real legacy, uh, if he wanted to sum it up, would be he was a bridge in his person between the, what we would call the freedom movement. As I said, SNCC started out as a civil rights movement, a civil rights organization. But it ended up as a freedom organization. It went from civil rights as Americans to diversity rights as black people. So he was a bridge for all of this. He understood it. And uh, he brought the freedom movement into um, the movement for women's rights, uh, into uh, you know, the, the movement against the Klan, the, the, against hatred, um, and he brought those movements into the freedom movement. The civil rights movement um, was talking about formal legal rights of people. They were civil rights guaranteed by the Constitution. Civil meaning society. What are your rights in law? Well, you have the right to vote. You have the right to equality. Uh, these were um, all court decisions. You know, you can point to a court decision that says you have the right to vote. Uh, and laws, civil rights. And why do you have these rights? Because you are an American citizen. These are legal rights. But black people for 400 years didn't feel themselves to be Americans. You know, they were only three-fifths of an American for hundreds of years. Or, well, ever since the Constitution came to be. Before that, they were nothing. They were chattel property. They weren't people. And it's not that they felt themselves not to be people, but they knew that this is what America, how America was treating them. They did not feel part of America. They knew America considered them property. Nobody considered themselves property. And then they knew America considered themselves three-fifths of a person. Um, so they didn't consider themselves by, I'm, you know, this is a, a great overgeneralization. There's a lot of people, a lot of very courageous people who say, I'm a black and I've always felt myself American. That's true. But by and large, the average black person did not feel themselves part of America the way that they saw America being portrayed on television. They wanted freedom for black people. Freedom meaning as black people, they wanted to be as free in America as white people. Not because it said so in the Constitution, but because they were black people and had been here before most white people, you know, before the ancestors of most white people living in America. They built America. 
black people built America. And this is what was in their mind, and this is what they meant by freedom. When Julian died, um, his uh, wish, and, and by the way, part of his legacy, really, this is hardly ever spoken about, was to make the, the movement broader than just a religious movement. He was not religious. And he never pretended to be. Most of us sort of used religion, you know, just went along with it. Julian didn't fight it. He wasn't against religion, but that was not part of him. And he never pretended it was. And that's something else that he helped broaden the freedom movement and he helped bring non-religious movements closer to religious movements. When he died, um, there was no um, funeral, religious funeral services. There were memorial services later on. But what there was, and I believe this was his wish, that on, at a certain time, on a certain day, people across the country would put flames, would put candles in leaves and paper that would float on water. And that's what happened. At a certain time, people across the country did this in memory of Julian. And that was Julian in a couple of ways. First of all, bringing people together across the country, across the environmental movement, which he was also active in, uh, the freedom movement, the women's movement, um, the union movement, people that were fighting on all fronts for progressive causes that weren't speaking to each other, didn't have occasion to speak to each other, not necessarily opposed to each other, were doing the same thing at the same time in memory of Julian, putting this light or things that are floating in the water. That's one thing. And then, when you float in the water, you eventually get to the ocean. You're, you're spreading. Uh, you're part of a movement that's spreading worldwide. And that was Julian too, part of bringing people together in a movement that was spreading. And I think that sums up his legacy. Julian died very suddenly. Uh, he was on vacation. Um, I had seen him very shortly before he left, and uh, he was at the uh, 50th anniversary of Freedom Summer, which I helped to organize. And he was, you know, you could see he, he wasn't as vigorous as he was. This was on Tougaloo campus, and he had to uh, ride on carts instead of hiking all over the place. But he was still vibrant. When he died, um, I, it hit me so hard. It's hard to describe. Yeah. And it wasn't because we, I, I mean, I, I can't say that we were close, but he meant so much to me that I felt that I, uh, something was lost in me. Something that I had depended on as an activist. I had depended on the existence of Julian Bond, and now he was gone.